You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. Serious talk about the sacred book. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Well, welcome everyone to the podcast, The Bible for Normal People. Today, um, it's going to be just me. Last time it was me, we talked about how we might want to take the Bible seriously, but not literally as well as giving a little background on myself. But today we're going to talk about a particular book of the Bible. We're going to talk about the book of Jonah. And there's a few reasons for that. I think it highlights a lot of the challenges that we face when we read our Bibles, especially if we were reading it given a particular background or tradition. But it also holds a just a special place for me as a pastor. I shared last time going through my own wrestling and challenges with the Bible particularly, um, but also then, of course, it, it doesn't get contained there, but spreads out into faith in general. And there's a particular challenge to going through a crisis of faith and, and these dark nights of the soul when you're a pastor and your paycheck depends on you may be not going through some of these things. So it's it's a really difficult time. I have a real heart for people in ministry who are torn, and sometimes by very good motivations, not wanting to uh, injure or harm or hurt the faith of, of their congregation and others, while at the same time not being able to deny that they're going through a lot of changes in their faith journey. So Jonah was particularly, for whatever reason, reassuring to me during that time. I I learned to fall in love with the book, and we'll see uh, perhaps why as we go through this. Maybe some of the reasons why Jonah would have been so attractive to me going through uh, such a time. But really this today, to keep it somewhat brief, we're going to talk about three key points to understanding Jonah. So I'll try to keep it at three, probably won't get to the second half of the book. But the other disclaimer I want to say is I'm probably going to get the verse uh, numbers wrong as we go through this because the Hebrew is numbered differently than the English, and I go back and forth, I get confused. I, I probably tend to refer to the Hebrew uh, verses more often than the English, so if you're trying to follow along and I say a verse that's wrong, maybe look a few verses ahead or a few verses behind and you'll find it. But the first thing, uh, the first point I want to make is that Jonah is a parable. And normally I would maybe talk about how we could, you know, argue both ways, whether it's historical or not. But at the end of the day, we'll just cut to the chase and, and I'll just say Jonah is a parable. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but but the thing I want to start out with is just saying that, you know, genre matters. What kind of book you're reading is really important. And if you don't force Jonah into being a historically accurate book, it reads so much better. It starts to look a lot less like prophecy in the nonfiction sense and a lot more like a parable, stylized fiction. It has a very specific uh, purpose or a, a a point to it. So if we look at the the setting for this, it also points to the fact that Jonah is probably uh, a parable. So the other prophets, if if we look at Jonah next to the other prophets in our Bible, we can see the stark difference in how Jonah is set up. So, you know, the other prophets, they're situated in historical situations. They name the kings that they're under, the kings that they're prophesying against. But Jonah contains no dates. It contains no mention of any king. In fact, none of the people in the story are mentioned by name except for Jonah. Not even the king of Nineveh, which, by the way, is interesting considering cities don't usually have kings in that sense. But it never mentions the historical elephant in the room that is so front and center in a lot of the prophetic books, that relationship strained maybe is an understatement, that strained relationship between Israel and Assyria, given the exile. That's not mentioned in Jonah 
even though the uh, other character in this book that's not named is the king of Nineveh, which would have been the capital of Assyria. So while it ignores what we might call historical details, it gives a lot, on the other hand, of what we would call like narratival, narrative story or like imaginative details. Like the sailors are casting lots, they're throwing the cargo over to save themselves, there's a worm that eats the castor oil plant. These are all details without any really any real prophetic in the sense of uh, Jonah acting or or prophesying in his words. There's not a lot of significance to these details, not a lot of historical details. So, in other words, if you read Jonah side by side with the other prophets, you can't help get a sense that this is a bit more of a once upon a time feel. Um, like a theological Aesop's fable than, like, say, Isaiah or Jeremiah. Uh, The other thing to consider under this point, you know, Jonah is a parable, is that it's written in the name of uh, Jonah, son of Amittai. And he's only mentioned once in the whole Bible. In 2 Kings 14, he gets one or two sentences, basically, and they're not even about him. The sentences are actually about Jeroboam. That's an evil king. Uh, restored a border, and this was spoken by the Lord's servant, Jonah, son of Amittai. That's all. That's it. That's all we have. So, uh, that's interesting, um, and it's not at all out of character for uh, writings. Uh, you know, Jonah is likely written pretty late. Uh, it's not at all unheard of that writers would take historical figures that don't have a very clear background and fill out some of that background with Uh, fiction, or some of these accounts like what we have in Jonah. That wouldn't be uncommon. Now, there's something that's ironic, which there's a lot of irony, by the way, in the book of Jonah. But one thing that's ironic is Jonah, son of Amittai. Amittai means faithfulness. So Jonah is really son of faithfulness. And we'll see how ironic that is for his name to be the son of faithfulness in this book. And if you've read the book, you'll know why. The other thing, you know, we begin with the word of the Lord came to so and so saying. That's normally how a prophetic book would start, uh, but that's not. That's what we would come to expect. But um, what we have in Jonah isn't what we would expect. Um, it's not the word of the Lord came to so and so saying. It's almost as if we at someone were to ask the question, you know, what would happen if a prophet heard the word of the Lord? but didn't deliver it, didn't actually say what the word of the Lord was. And so we have this like fictionalized account of what that would be. So uh, there's other reasons why I would put Jonah in the parable category. Um, You know, there's a lot of rhetorical devices. It's a really fun book to read, by the way, if you don't have to force it into these boxes of being historically accurate. It's a really fun, but it's almost like a child... Uh, it's almost like a comic book type reading if you understand some of the humor, the irony of the book. So, you know, some things that are kind of lean in that direction would be some of the personification. So in chapter one, when Jonah is escaping, the ship that he's on reckons that it's going to break up or thought about breaking up. And the sea stopped its rage in the same chapter, but it's very active. Like these, these forces, the boat and the ocean, have are are spoken of as almost like they have their own personalities. There's also a lot of uh, exaggeration or extreme terms. So everything in the Book of Jonah is big, like really big scale. So it's like uh, talking to that friend of yours where everything is the greatest thing ever. It was like the biggest thing and it was like the greatest thing. That's how Jonah reads. So in just chapter one alone, we have this intense language like 10 times. So Nineveh is the great city. Yahweh hurls a great wind. There's a great storm. They were extremely frightened. There's a great storm. Not only do you get thrown, but you get hurled into the sea and the way you intensify words in Hebrew is you is you uh, say it twice essentially it's oversimplifying but you would say it twice and we have this thing again and again in 
the first parts of Jonah a lot in chapter 1 and a few times in chapter 3 as well. It's just such a well-crafted story. I mean, <clears throat> another thing too, let take chapter 1. So let's back up and just look at chapter 1. The irony and the poignancy is just prime parable material. So on the boat, you have... Uh, So Jonah goes down and he gets on a boat to run away from God. We'll back up and tell the beginning of the story. But for here, in chapter 1, Jonah goes down, he gets on a boat, he's running from God after God tells him to go to Nineveh and he doesn't want to. And on the boat, there are these pagan sailors. And it's just such a fun vignette here, a little mini story um, that's kind of a parable in its own right. But you have the pagan sailors conversion experience in this chapter and Jonah's deconversion. So the sailors go from pagans, it says in chapter one, they're calling on their own gods. By the end of the chapter, they're Yahweh worshipers. Not only that, but they make sacrifices and vows to Yahweh, to the God of Jonah. And the fact that they sacrifice and make vows makes me think that this is, again, highly charged theology or parable rather than history. So, uh, for instance, you know, these are things that you would do in the temple, which pagans aren't allowed to do. They're not allowed to go and make sacrifices and vows to the Lord there. Um, And there's things that you don't do in a boat. So, um, basically, in chapter 1, to make the point that these pagans are converting, the writer basically transports us to the temple just to show how faithful these pagans are by the end of this chapter to God. They're sacrificing, making vows, they're doing all the right things. Um, And the point doesn't seem at all to be that they are making sacrifices and offering vows on the boat. Um, I don't think you would really want to be burning up sacrifices on a wooden boat. But these are the exact things that Jonah promises to do later on when he's reconverted. Uh, He promises to make sacrifices and vows. Uh, The exact same phrase as we have here. So the pagan sailors become Yahweh worshippers while the prophet of God becomes a pagan in his actions and seen. That's chapter 1. So, uh, another reason, again, that I think this this book just plays so much better as a parable. And as a brief side note, you know, one of the main arguments that I often get in return when I talk about this is, wait, wait a second, doesn't Jesus talk about Jonah? Like, doesn't it mean that he thinks it's historical since he mentioned it? So, let's just address that here for a second. First of all, it's not strange at all to compare ourselves to fictional characters, right? So we do that, I think we do that all the time. So we go on quests like Frodo, we take risks like Harry Potter, we persevere like Rudy. I don't know if people actually still watch Rudy. Don't tell anyone, but I really didn't actually like Rudy. I think there's a lot more inspiring movies out there than Rudy, but that's beside the point. Uh, In fact, it seems like that's the point of fiction. A lot of times, the point is that it gives us a voice. It helps give voice to our real-life experiences. It connects with us. It bridges that gap. So comparing ourselves to fictional characters doesn't seem out of place with most of human culture. We've been doing that for a very long time. But secondly, I think the most compelling thing for why I don't think it matters at all that Jesus mentions Jonah um, in Matthew 12, he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth or something like that. So Jesus mentions Jonah in Matthew 12, and so people say, oh, well then, you know, Jesus clearly thought Jonah was historical because he mentions him. Uh, so one, I don't think it's, at all strange that he compares himself to a fictional character. I don't think that's compelling. And secondly, Jesus himself fictionalizes a historical character 
himself. He he does this in the Gospels. So in in I think it's Luke chapter sixteen. There's a parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and so Abraham is in this parable, a real character, a real person plays a character in this clearly fictional story that Jesus is telling to make a moral point, a parable. I don't think that Jesus is saying that we needed to believe that Abraham really did the things that Jesus says he does in the parable because he uses them in the story. I think Luke chapter 16 is a really good parallel for how Jonah is used in the book of Jonah. It's a historical character people would know, people would recognize the name, and Jesus puts that character, that historical person, in a fictionalized context to make a point. And usually you would do that to make it a stronger point. If you're using a historical figure that people know about, it could carry stronger weight. And Jesus does this because, again, Jesus is in the same uh, swims in the same water, breathes the same air culturally that the writer of Jonah would have not too long before Jesus arrives on the scene. So it's not at all compelling to me that just because Jesus uses him, that it makes it, uh, it means that Jesus even thought it was a historically accurate account. So why does Jesus use Jonah then in Matthew chapter 12? Well, I think there's a few reasons. One, I think, is that the story of Jonah is a, just a wonderfully written story about being abandoned by God for three days, just a heart-wrenching descent, and we'll talk about that. I think that's part of why, I think it's mostly why it really connected with me. I, I mostly connected with the first two chapters of Jonah, and it really does connect with this uh, story that Jesus has uh, as well. And then I think it's also... Jesus uses it because Jonah isn't just any old parable. It's a parable about Israel. That's, I think, the second point I'm going to make, the second key. So the first key point is that Jonah is a parable to help us read it. But the second is Jonah is not just any old parable, but Jonah is about Israel. And if you listened to the podcast a few weeks ago where Pete talked about Adam and Eve... And if you've read uh, our book, Genesis for Normal People, then you'll uh, understand that you know Adam and Eve is also a story about Israel. It's, it's, a, it's a miniature picture. It's a miniature version of the Israel story. And if you think about Jonah, it's the same thing. I don't know if you get tired of us saying this in, in the books or on the podcast, but the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, is all about Israel. And Jonah's no exception. So, you know, think about the parallels between Jonah's story and Israel's story. So, Israel, you know, given the commands in Deuteronomy, if you do this, um, there will be a blessing, these things will happen. Jonah's given a command in chapter 1, arise, Jonah, go and preach the word of the Lord to the Ninevites. And then there's disobedience, of course, Israel, um, you know, the Israel story. In Samuel Kings, the kings are all jacked up. Israelites are being disobedient. They're oppressive and these things. Um, And then in chapter 1 of Jonah, there's disobedience. And he arises, but instead of going to the Ninevites, he flees. Uh, He he, he disobeys God. And so there's exile, right? There's the exodus in the Israel story, of course, and then the actual exile, the Babylonian exile, Assyrian exile from the Israel story, and Jonah has his own exile in chapter 2, although he exiles himself in chapter 1, which we could argue has its parallels in the Israel story as well. So Jonah's about Israel, then we have redemption, we have grumbling, we even include the grumbling part of Israel's story here in Jonah, where after the redemption, there's still there's still grumbling. But... Um, One other thing here, we'll come back to that, but another thing that points to Jonah being about Israel is actually chapter 2. So if you're really astute reader, so we talked about chapter 1 being about the conversion of the pagan sailors into 
true Yahweh worshippers and the deconversion of Jonah into paganism. Well, chapter 2, if you read that closely, you would recognize something. If you were an ancient Israelite, you probably would recognize it uh, right off. That Jonah 2 is not actually Jonah's own words. It's a pastiche of psalms. It's all these psalms stitched together to make this coherent prayer. It's, it's actually uh, quite a brilliant uh, set of, of writings here, the way that they were able to put these psalms together into a coherent prayer for Jonah in the belly of the fish. So it uses parts of Psalm 18, 130, I think it is, it's Psalm 30, Psalm 42. There's probably 20 or so psalms that are, you. I don't know how many, there's a lot in Jonah chapter 2. And so the point is that that Jonah's descent, you know, as Jonah goes down, Jonah's redemption, sort of the the climax of this story isn't told from out of the blue, but it's it's told using the songbook of Israel. It's told using the psalms of Israel. This would be like if we were reading a story and all of a sudden, the main character started quoting snippets of hymns, like, How Great Thou Art, or Great Is Thy Faithfulness, or, I don't know, I'm assuming everyone knows what those hymns are. Um, maybe not every tradition sings those hymns, but... Uh, so, I mean, this is, of course, it's supposed to be because it's an intimate, reflective time, and he's in the belly of the fish... Um, This is his prayer in the belly of the fish. But this also is a way to identify Jonah with Israel. It's bringing Jonah into the larger story of Israel. And and so chapter 2 really is what seems to be telling us that this story is about Israel. It's not about Jonah as a historical figure, but it's a parable. It's about something bigger. So, of course, then we have the redemption after he's in the belly of the fish, he gets vomited out. Um, so there's a, a redemptive act just as, you know, in the story of Israel. A quick side note, which maybe it's just, uh, again, this is fun facts because Jonah's a fascinating book. But, uh, and maybe it's just a stylistic or, I mean, a, a scribal error or something like that. But it's very interesting. Some of the rabbis, I think, note that if you read chapter beginning of chapter two in in the Hebrew, the fish that swallows Jonah, it actually starts as a as a male fish, so it's a it's a boy fish. In chapter one, verse seventeen, thereabouts. But then after it swallows Jonah, it becomes a girl fish. So in chapter 1, verse 17, it's um, um, the dog, and then it becomes a daga, which is the feminine form of the fish, in chapter 2, verse 1 or so. And then um, it becomes a boy fish again after it vomits Jonah on dry land. So maybe it's not significant, but it sounds to me like the, the fish gets pregnant with Jonah. Uh, of course, my kids love that interpretation, but there's also something significant about that redemption, right? Talk about rebirth. There's almost a, a literal, um, literal in the figurative sense, rebirth in this parable of the fish going from a male fish to being a female fish as though the fish is now pregnant with Jonah and then Jonah is rebirthed out onto the dry land, which has a lot of creation language there too, but we won't have time to get into that today. So, um, anyway, then we kind of have this grumbling after he spit up, he goes, he tells the Ninevites, they repent and he's kind of pissed about it. And there's a lot of Exodus language in there where the Israelites, of course, were grumbling in the wilderness as well. Probably some grumbling in the post exile, right? So we end the story of Jonah with a cliffhanger. I mean, if it's written late in the post-exilic period, after people have kind of come back to the land, then it makes sense. Because we're still in this like weird period of being back in the land, but not really. 
being delivered, but not really, being grateful for God's provision, but not really, forgiving our enemies for sacking us, but you know, not really. So it's interesting that we sort of end the story with this cliffhanger. There's no real, you should read it again if you haven't. It's really short, and there's not a clear ending. It just sort of peters out. So um, all of this kind of points to the fact that Jonah is about Israel. So we have that it's a parable. It's not just a parable about anything, but a parable about Israel. And then the third thing, which seems a little off, but I think it's important because we're talking about key uh, points to understanding Jonah. And there's so many other points we could make. But I think the third one is understanding that Jonah goes down. And I mean that in the story, this is a story about going down. So, the first word in the Hebrew after the introductory verse is the word arise. It's get up. Get up and go. Uh, So, it's God speaking to Jonah. And, of course, those are commands. Arise and go. So, this is how Jonah starts. And it's the word arise is important because it's the word up. It's, it's an upward movement word. And it's the only time we're going to get a word that says anything about going up until later in chapter 2. So how does Jonah react to God's command? He arises, and you think he's arising to go to Nineveh, but instead he flees. And when he flees... He starts to go down, and he continues to go down, down, down. And the word that's used over and over again is Yerod, which is actually where my name comes from, Jared. But he continues to go down. So in verse 3 of chapter 1, he goes down to Joppa. Then later in that same verse, he goes down into the ship. And then in verse 5, he goes down into the hold of the ship. Then later in verse 5... He goes to sleep. So he's kind of going down now, almost in this, like, in this metaphorical sense. And then in 15, he's going down over the boat into the sea. And then in 17, he goes down into the belly of the fish. He's going, he just keeps going down. And then in chapter 2, we enter this prayer, which gets very poetic. And if we had more time, We'd go into uh, how important it is, if we're going to understand chapter 2 well, that we need to understand the ancient Near East understanding of cosmology or how the world is shaped. Because chapter 2 really only makes sense if you accept how the Bible presents the creation of the world in Genesis 1-3, to which again pick up a lot of books these days will do that, or just go to Google and Type in A-N-E or Ancient Near Eastern Cosmology on your Google Images and you'll kind of see how things are framed. But in chapter 2, that becomes really important to understand what's what's happening there. Otherwise, things like don't make sense. If you read chapter 2 in a lot of translations, actually, it, it gets really convoluted. It's really hard to make sense of. But if you understand how the ancient people would have thought about creation then you would see that Jonah is going down through creation. And then the bars of the earth close. Some translations say close him in, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I think it makes a lot more sense that Jonah gets closed out of creation. And that would be in verses, yeah, verse 6. So I went down to the land and the bars closed upon me forever. It's I think a better translation is, you know, it goes down and, and the the bars of the earth shut them out. So understanding that it's explicitly using this word Yarad throughout this first chapter, Jonah's descent into disobedience. He's going down to Joppa, down into the ship, down to the hold of the ship. Then he's thrown over to the sea and goes down further until he's swallowed up by the fish. And then, based on his poetry, his prayer in chapter 2, 
sounds like the fish is taking him down even further, um, all the way down to the depths of Sheol, down into the primeval deep, into the heart of the seas. Of course, like Jesus, right? Jesus spent three days in the heart of the earth, just like uh, Jonah is describing here, until he shut out of creation, which evokes again another psalm, Psalm 139, which says, you know, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from you? If I ascend up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I go to the farthest limits of the sea, you're there. I can't run away from you, God. And in Psalm 139, that's a comforting thing. But in Jonah, Jonah sort of flips Psalm 139 on his head. Where in Psalm 139, it's saying, Oh, it's so comforting to know I can't go anywhere where God can't find me and be with me and comfort me. But for Jonah... He says, I'm going to go flee from the Lord. And it's almost as though Jonah is saying, the book of Jonah is saying, oh, you want to flee from Yahweh? Well, hold on to your hat. You're going to go for a ride because the only place that you can flee from Yahweh is out of creation. And so this journey from chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse Uh, I think in the English, it's verse 6. I think it's chapter 2, verse 4 in the Hebrew. We have this descent, the descent of Jonah going all the way down, being shut out of creation. And I think it's important because then you have this climactic, they have this climactic verse in chapter 2, verse 6 that kind of cuts halfway through the verse. So in the first part of chapter 6, he's going shut out of creation. And then the second half Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. So that's the first time we have an upward. You brought my life up from the pit. It's the first time. So that is the redemption of Jonah. Right there in chapter 2, verse 6. That's when we have the resurrection of Jonah. He's been going down. He gets shut out of creation, completely abandoned by God. That's the only place you can go, out of creation. And when that happens, God raises his life up from the pit. So that's kind of that climactic redemptive verse and a re-entry. So we have an exile and then we have redemption, uh, which would have followed tracked with the hopes of the Israelite people, clearly tracked with Jesus's story. So I think that's important to recognize. Of course, we could go on um, for a long time about Jonah, and we can go into chapters 3 and 4, which has a lot of Exodus language. It looks as though maybe Jonah is celebrating or being forced to celebrate Sukkot, um, remembering how God brought the Israelites out of Exodus or out of Egypt and brought them into the land, and yet there's still this ingratitude or willing, unwillingness to show grace to one's enemy or to the stranger, to the foreigner. Anyway, we won't go into that. So just as a reminder, the three points I think that are really important to consider is that Jonah is a parable. That's a parable about Israel. And this device that the writer uses of Jonah's descent in chapter 1 all the way through chapter 2 into verse 6, the climactic moment when his life is redeemed and then he is born again. Again, if you take the pregnant fish interpretation, which I like to do, then Jonah is born again out onto dry land, a new creation. Um, It uses the same language as Genesis, the the dry land, this new creation of Jonah, and then uh, tracking with Israel's story through that. So hopefully this has been a helpful time. I love the book of Jonah. Again, it, it touches me because of of the time in my life that uh, I really dug into the story and what it meant for me and my faith at the time as a pastor who was struggling with a lot of doubts and a lot of questions and feeling abandoned by God and uh, there's just powerful climactic redemption in chapter 2, but also that the book is willing to go down into the depths that it doesn't shy away from these moments of life uh, where we are being dragged down almost out of creation away from the presence of God and and that uh, feeling of what that that feels like and that experience. 
So always appreciated, Jonah. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, hope you join us next time. Just want to highlight one thing quickly, and that is uh, if you haven't already, please uh, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com front slash the Bible for normal people. And for as little as a as dollar a month, you can support us and what we're doing as we gear up here for season two coming up in just a few months have some great new guests that we want to share uh, with you, um, some topics, and also there's ways to connect with a broader community there on patreon.com, front slash the Bible for normal people. We hope you check it out. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for listening, and we'll hopefully catch you next time.